celebrate and acknowledge the important role that girls and women play in science and technology and to support gender equality in these fields. As we celebrate this day today, I take pride in mentioning here that presently science and technology department in government of Punjab is primarily led by women with three out of five HODs being women and that one out of three major science cities is women led. Presently, even the state government is led by a women chief secretary. Today, we have incredible women with us whose work breaks boundaries, makes new words possible, and sets the stage for the future. These women are fighters. They are visionaries. They are tireless advocates for change, for progress, for hope. We have with us Dr. Neelima Jareth, Director General, Science City, Madam Huma Abidi, Senior Director, Artificial Intelligence, Intel, California, USA, and Ms. Khushi Sharma, a young researcher and a blogger. Before I request Director General Science City to give inaugural remarks, I take pleasure to introduce her to you. Uh, Dr. Neelima Jarath is a PhD in Botany with specialization in environmental sciences. She is a double gold medalist and a state awardee for her work in science and environment. She has undertaken certificate courses in environment and sustainable development from International Center for Conservation Education, UK, Smithsonian Institution, USA, and Uppsala University, Sweden. Widely traveled internationally, she has been invited as environment education expert by UNESCO, UNDP, UNU, IES, and FAO, and has 30 books to her credit. Prior to joining as Director General Pushpa Gujral Science City, she was Executive Director, Punjab State Council for Science and Technology, and Founder Member Secretary of State Biodiversity Board and State Innovation Council, and has been instrumental in establishing the Patent Information Center. Climate Change Knowledge Center, Envis Center, and Regional Center for Education on Sustainable Development. She is a member of several central and state expert committees. Pushpa Gujra Science City received the National Award for Science Communication in 2016 under her leadership. May I request Dr. Neelima Jarath to give her inaugural remarks? Madam, please. Thank you, Lovleen. Uh, thank you for those very kind words. And a very good morning, namaste, satsrikal to everybody. I'm delighted to be with all of you today for three reasons. One, we are celebrating women and we are celebrating science, a subject which I'm passionate about. Two, we have a very eloquent speaker who has crossed all barriers, broken the male bastions, and who would be speaking to us today on the subject of artificial intelligence. And we are also have with us a young blogger who is deeply interested in science and has started researching at a very young age. Uh, speaking about artificial intelligence, I'm not an expert in that area, but I do know that when we take the help of Cortana, or when we ask Google to type uh, what we speak, when we ask uh, Alexa to play a song of our choice, or when we use the face recognition password on our smartphone, we are using artificial intelligence. Uh, I wonder whether some of you have seen a um, film which came, uh, which became a blockbuster, and it came sometime um, in 2003 or four, which was titled Tarzan the Wonder Car. And in this film, there is a car which moves around without a driver because it is seemingly being operated by a spirit. Now, without those spirits, driverless cars are a reality. I remember that when discussion on driverless cars was going on, people around would say, who would sit in a car where you can't even see the driver or there is nobody who can see the road. But now it is a reality. People have started using it at places. At least it has been tried now. Uh, I also remember a very interesting event. Uh, 
we were preparing a project on climate change and we were trying to develop an insurance instrument for heat stressed animals. The insurance company was very worried that, in, that there could be a case where uh, a benefit claimer could use the same animal again and again to claim a particular benefit in the name of the animal being heat stressed. While we were discussing on how to solve this issue, we met a young entrepreneur who had developed more than 100 facial recognition characters. And you could clearly pinpoint or identify a particular animal from another one. And if this person had started a company called Moo Cow or Moo Farm, something like that. And it was really good that we found an answer to the question which our insurance agent was trying to ask us. So this is the power of artificial intelligence. I won't speak more on this because our uh, speaker is an expert. She's a senior director in Intel, and she would tell us how artificial intelligence is being used and where the world stands today. But as far as women are concerned, uh, I know that women have been very successful in the area of medicine. We find a lot of women in the area of biology, but engineering and maths were considered to be male dominated areas. Uh, I remember as a student, there were hardly any engineering colleges which would accept women as uh, students who would give admission to women. But now we find women in IITs and they are doing so well. And I'm very happy today that we have Madam Huma Abidi, who was inspiring to become a doctor, but was destined to become an engineer, and also destined to become a senior director in Intel, who broke all the barriers of the male bastions and also broke the proverbial glass ceiling. I heartily welcome you, Huma. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation to speak to our students today. Uh, I also welcome Ms. Khushi Sharma, our young scientist. I had read her blog some time back and then I had asked her to share her full paper, which she did. And I was really, really impressed with the kind of work she was doing and the kind of thought process which our young children have these days. Um, I know that if I was asked to compete with them, I would lose. Even today, when she has joined us to, for her talk, to, for, to share her experiences, um, she has just walked out of an examination. She had an exam today morning. She finished it off before this program began. So I welcome you, Kushi. Thank you very much for being with us today. And I'm sure your talk will also inspire a lot of young girls, your peers. Um, I also welcome all the students, all the faculty, all teachers from, uh, I'm told we have people from IIT Delhi, from ISER, from IIT Kanpur, uh, IIT Roper, then Thapar Institute of Engineering and Technology, both the Punjab Technical Universe, Universities, several other universities who are with us today. I welcome all of you. Uh, we also have uh, officers from certain government departments as well as uh, of officers from certain corporate bodies. I welcome all of you for sparing your time to be with us today and to celebrate the, this day with us at Pushpagajal Science City. But before, uh, I would not want to come more between you and our very beautiful and very, um, very well-known speakers. So, but 
before I end, let me also say that women are achieving this, all of this today, in spite of their being saddled with the biological responsibility of bearing children and taking primarily care of the family. So not coming between you and the speakers anymore. I welcome you all once again, and I request my colleague, Dr. Lavlin, to kindly introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Uh, it is a privilege to introduce the woman who spearheads artificial intelligence for Intel's projects, Madam Huma Abidi. Uh, madam Abidi is a senior director of artificial intelligence software products and engineering at Intel and is, is responsible for strategy, roadmaps, requirements, validation, and benchmarking of deep learning, machine learning, and analytics software product, products. She leads a globally diverse team of engineers and technologists responsible for delivering world-class products that enable customers to create AI solutions. Madam Huma joined Intel as a software engineer and has since worked in a variety of engineering validation and management roles in the area of compilers, binary translation and artificial intelligence, and deep learning. Twice she has received the Intel Achievement Award, Intel's highest honor, and thrice awarded with the Intel Software Quality Award for delivering quality software. She is passionate about women's education, supporting several organizations around the world for this cause. She was recently nominated for Venture Beat 2020, and she is a finalist for a Women in Artificial Intelligence Award in Mentorship category. Madam Huma has been listed as one of the four women shaping Intel's AI business by the Silicon Valley Business Journal. I invite Madam Huma Abidi uh, to deliver her talk. Uh, Madam Abidi will talk on how artificial intelligence can change the life of women across the world and why should we care about artificial intelligence. Uh, the screen is all yours, Madam. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Nilu Didi. I call her Nilu Didi and it's because of her that I'm here. But I'm, I'm really, really happy. I mean, it's just listening to, to her and to Lavleen and hearing about Hushi and, and the fact that so many of you have joined. Um, I'm really happy to join and let me share my screen so that make it easier. And I speak Hindi just as well, even though I moved to the US probably before many of you, most of you were born. I moved here in the 90s, but I speak very well. And as I was telling uh, Nilima Diti that my kids, even though they were born here, they can speak Hindi as well. So, so I really enjoy uh, question answers. So I hope that we spend some time uh, doing that and let me know when you can see my screen. We can see your screen, yeah. You can see it? Yes. All right. So, um, I think what Lavleen read was my, I wouldn't say resume, but about me from LinkedIn. That's the LinkedIn profile. And I, I, you can follow me on Twitter if you like, because I post a few things, you know, what's going on, et cetera. And uh, the title is why should we care about AI? I, I was thinking, you know, it's, I work in AI and what should I talk about? And it's, it's, it's sort of a general talk about AI, but obviously I have some uh, use cases and things that I work on. And I have tried to keep it at a level that hopefully would be interesting to, to all of you, most of you. But um, uh, you can contact me uh, via um, Twitter or LinkedIn if you need more uh, details on anything. And I hope that we will um, spend some time chatting and then I can answer your questions. So let's get started. Um, Hmm. Some reason it's not moving. Let me try. Yeah, there it is. So, so these are the four things that I have divided my uh, talk into. The first one is growing impact of AI. Second is at a very high level, what is, what is artificial intelligence? What is machine learning? What is deep learning? And the, all of these terms I, I use um, instead of each other, but obviously there are some differences and I will explain that. How to get started with AI? There's a lot, a lot of material which is available. And so I'll give some examples. And then finally, AI ethics and social good. That is my favorite topic. I'm very passionate about that, both at work and outside. So, so we'll talk about that as well, okay? Okay. 
All right. So, so this is, as I mentioned, AI is everywhere. And, and as uh, Nilima Didi also mentioned. So if you are using Google Map, if you, if you have a smartphone, you are using AI, as she said, right? It's forget about autonomous driving. By the way, I do have a Tesla and, and you can, I mean, even though you have to sit there, you, it act, actually let, drives on its own. So that's happening right now. But forget about more advanced things. If you are using Siri or Alexa, or if you are looking Google Map, or here you can, even if you order pizza, there are chatbots, or if you want watch Netflix recommendation, this is all 100% artificial intelligence, right? So the, the point of this slide is that AI is everywhere. And I have some of these categories that, that in all of these areas, we, we are working with our customers who, who are, it could be agriculture. I mean, it could be plant disease or how much water or achieving higher yield, energy, education, each one of these, I can, I, I have examples, but we can spend the whole hour just talking about how AI is, is changing all of these different areas. And healthcare is, is obviously very, very important and probably the most number of use cases that we have. So uh, from just vis vision like radiology to, to much more, and I, I'll give you more examples of that. So even if it's you know, retail or smartphone, it, it's everywhere, there is no doubt about it. And I hope that's clear to, to all of you. I just snuck in the slide here because we, I was told that this is, uh, you know, there's this the day, International Day for Girls and Women. And that's why we are having this talk. So I wanted to put this, uh, this slide here. And um, uh, this is something I, I, I heard um, Nilima Didi say that as well, but this is something that I'm absolutely passionate about. I have spent a majority of my career advocating for women because when I joined, um, most of the time I was the only woman in meetings. And um, along the way, you know, I. I had many mentors, both men and women, and who helped me. And so I, this is sort of paying back and I mentor like numerous women and I am in many, many committees. And, and, and one of the good things about Intel is that, that it, it really cares about diversity, equity, inclusion. And I just pasted a couple of things here. The first one was diversity inclusion are key to innovation. So this was our CEO also said that this is not just a good thing to do diversity for women underrepresented minority, but it's also good for business. This is this, this has been found out that uh, by having diverse people at every level that that makes your business do better. And, um, and there was another quote which says we must collaborate, not compete on diversity. So it's, it's, it's been, um, especially in the US for, I think in India, the number are more, but in the US, uh, the women in engineering is somewhere between 14% to 24%, and depending on which field, and AI is, is actually even less in some cases. So there is a lot of work to be done. So we took the goal and I am part of that. So I had help with the 20, um, 15 goal and that we had taken by 2020 that at every level women and underrepresented minority would be represented. We met that goal and the next goal is to have double the number of women and underrepresented minorities in senior leadership roles. So that's important that you may have women but if you don't have them at the top level then, then that's a problem too. So that, and then exceeding uh, 40%, I just mentioned that, that you know, it's about 14 to 24%. So having a goal which says to exceed 40% is, is a big thing. Um, I just put in a few of these uh, logos where I'm very active and, and you know, I support and women in machine, oops, sorry. Women in machine learning is something that I formed, founded at Intel. And so there I, you know, bring technical topics so whether I will talk or bring, you know, guests and VPs and, or even if it's mindfulness, you know, just, just talk about so there's this women and men are welcome as well, but I, I was a founder of this at Inter. So we do a lot of that. And VentureBeat was uh, mentioned by Levleen that VentureBeat is a very prestigious organization here. And, and they, uh, they do a lot of uh, these kind of things. And, and they, uh, you know, invite me as guest speaker to talk about recently about 
ethical AI and, and those kind of things. So I just put a few things here, but um, this is something I'm very passionate about. So I wanted to um, put this slide he in here, though it may not have much to do with AI, but um, since uh, that's what we are celebrating today, I wanted to put it in. Okay. Okay, so um, why now? So this, this slide, um, I have used this slide before and, and why now as in AI has been around for, believe it or not, about 50 years. But um, it's only there's some developments happen that made AI possible now. And in fact, a couple of years ago, there were uh, Turing Award winners. Turing Award is equivalent to Nobel Prize in computer science. And it was given to uh, Lee Nyukan, uh, Benjiu, and Hinton, and for the work that they did about 30 years ago. And that work was only possible now. So what I'm showing you here is that these are the three things that made it possible. First is availability of data. I mean, the smartphones, the laptops, and, and, and uh, all of these digital things that made it possible for data to be shared. So there is a lot of data that is available. Then there is better hardware. And um, here I'm just showing that in, within 10 years, something that cost $1,000 would cost three cents. So, so the, the amount of the hardware became cheaper, much more accessible. And lastly, the algorithms, the development in neural networks, and I will talk about that. That's something I work in. So because of these things, it became, um, uh, AI became a reality. In, in theory, all of those things were there, but because of these developments, it became possible to apply it. And um, it's sort of a simplified view of uh, history that when it actually happened, when did they cross the, the threshold? So it was about 2009 at Stanford, which is, very close to where I live. Um, and so the, the, some of the researchers found that when they are working on some graphical pr uh, processors, because of its uh, parallelism that it has, they were able to uh, find accuracy. They were able to train models. And, and if you look at this graph, for these are similar things for image, left side is image, right side is speech. So image is that vision that, that was being mentioned, right? That face recognition and speech is natural language processing that you can hear and it can translate and text to, et cetera. So both of these things, uh, let's talk about uh, image recognition. So the, the Y axis is basically showing the error rate and the X axis is showing the years. So around 2009, the accuracy, the error, error rates for the machine learning started going down and it went to a point, this is where the human error rate is and then it exceeded human. So it became better than human. Similarly for speech, the same thing happened. Now, a very important thing to note here is, I'm not saying that machine is better than human in everything. Machine, yeah, AI is better, but it's only good at one thing. The general artificial intelligence, if not hundreds, is decades away. So it's not that one um, AI will just start doing what human beings are doing. No, it is this. It is one model is good at one thing, and it will only do that. And plus, we can talk more about general artificial int general intelligence and all. But for now, all I'm saying is that there are cases. It's doing extremely well, much much better than anybody had expected. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'll walk you through some of the slides, some of the work that my team has been doing. And I'll go rather fast because I, I don't know if there is much sense in, in, in going into the details, but if anybody's interested, I would. So uh, this is a work that we did with Novartis, which is one of the biggest pharmaceuticals in the world. And uh, they had an interesting problem because they, this was for a drug discovery case and they have really large images and, and that had to be analyzed. And so my team worked with them and, and we reduced the time from hours to minutes. And now of course it's even, even faster and we are using 
Google's TensorFlow, and this is done on Xeon processor. But the, the, the point of the slide is that, that there, this drug discovery is one of the use cases. Now, there are many, many, many medical uh, imaging use cases, and I chose this one because it was done at a very small, I believe, a village uh, well, in China that they didn't have enough healthcare um, professions, professionals. So they, they were using these kind of handheld devices, um, ophthalmic scope to detect uh, retinopathy and other kind of things. But the, the point is that it was so accurate that even if a doctor is not there, these kind of to er eradicate blindness, this was a very good use case that was used. Um, Union Bank and MasterCard, there are many, many of them for fraud detection. Again, you know, this is this is a work that we had done. Um, this we do did it ourselves. So this is a, a you know manufacturing that Intel when it's making um, these chips, the packaging is is very manual intensive, and it takes a lot of time. So we would in fact this cafe was also. Um, it's sorry, it keeps moving for some reason. It's very sensitive. So it was also a framework that was developed by us. And so, so by using um, AI, and that is for visual visual inspection, it would see and it would detect that there is a, a damage. Now, damage sometimes is is cosmetic, sometimes it's real, but it, with a very very high accuracy, it would be able to say that this is this is good, this is bad, and so it would not only save. Uh, manual labor, but it would also be very, very accurate. Uh, Tabula is actually uh, world's largest recommendation engine, and they have. Uh, I, I think the data is uh, the numbers are even larger now. When I when I put this slide together, it was you know a billion unique visitors monthly. So in fact, uh, a couple of hours uh, ago, I had a meeting with with the developer. With a person in my team who who is doing doing more work with Tabula, and he was explaining what are the next things we are doing. So also something um, that we work with. So these are what I'm trying to show is that there are all different kinds of use cases uh, where AI can be applied. And um, if interested, I can go into details. But for now, it suffice to say that it it's used in many many use cases, right? This is another one. I, I try to choose different types so that it can give you a flavor of, of where it's being. And of course, these are the work that, that we are doing. So I'm more familiar with that. And um, this one is to find out, you know, there are solar farms in, in, in places where it's very difficult for a person to go. So we have, we have our own UAVs, uh, drones. And so the drone will take the picture and using AI, we would be able to say, okay, here's this particular solar panel has a defect. And then it can be, uh, then, then it can be fixed rather than somebody manually going in and checking. And so that was another interesting use case. Uh, this one, I, I just put uh, just before the, maybe an hour before this talk, um, and it is very interesting. So this is using GANs, which is generative adversarial neural networks. And um, if you look at this, this picture, these are you know, interesting people, right? Uh, guess what? None of them exist. These are all created by, by these GANs. So none of these people are real. It's just using this to, and, and, and the reason I put this picture here is because we are using the same technology to create um, CT scans. So um, why do we need to do that? Because, because, uh, because of privacy. So there are uh, these, uh, these um, scans that, are, that exist, but because of patient privacy, it cannot be shared from hospital to hospital. And for AI or deep neural network to work, you need a lot of data, a lot of these things that it can train on only after it gets trained on real uh, images or, or whatever the data is, then it will be able to predict. So we needed that. And so for that, some a person in my team, they use GANs and they were able to create a lot of these kind of images. So, so it's similar to this, right? They, they look so realistic. These are like real people. And similarly, we were able to create that. And because of 
anonymized uh, CT scans, then the training was better and then we scaled it and so on and so forth. Um, the next thing I wanted to share, which is also which I'm often asked to talk about just this, that how, uh, first of all, I call it engineering, engineer at art. And you know, there's a term called engineer at heart, right? Or whatever at heart, but I'm calling it engineer at art because um, these are the things that I have made. I like to paint and whether it's a floor or a wall or a, or a pot or whatever. So, or if it's embroidery, so I'd like to do those things, right? But being an AI person, I wanted to apply AI to that. So the next uh, slide I will show you is what, what is called neural style transfer. And so you can apply um, neural style transfer is actually a technique using AI. You can, uh, you basically have two inputs. You, one is your uh, content and the other is style. So you can convert your, your content to a, a third thing, which is a merger of, of the style and the content. So, I mean, these are not, maybe not the best examples, but I just put this slide here. But for example, if I, this is a painting that I had done, this girl with the hat. And then I use it, I, I use the style of a circuit board. And when you do that, um, I think there is somebody to be admitted. Okay, yeah, good. Um, anyways, so it, it's, uh, yeah, so it, it comes with an image, which, which is a combination of, of the circuit and the, this. And there are hundreds and hundreds of possibilities. Sometimes at night, I'm just sitting there and, and just trying so you can, I can use my picture with, with Monet or with, with any other artist or with, as, I'm, as you can see here, with circuit boards and, and I come up with, with amazing, amazing results. And so this is, this is a example of using uh, AI to use art, uh, to change or enhance art or whatever. So the point is, and then there is music that can be generated so, so AI is not just for, you know, the, the first slide that I showed you that AI is everywhere in industry and others, but it, it is also being used. It's, it's being used to generate music. It's being generated to actually write, art, write articles, uh, news and, and so on and so forth. I'm trying to keep track of time because I do want to talk to you guys. I will try to move fast. So um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, what are these things, right? So the, the first big umbrella is artificial intelligence where it says a program can sense, reason, act. <clears throat> Basically it has characteristics of a human behavior or a human behavior, right? So, so if there is something that, that a machine is doing, which a human being is doing, which in, in this case it's uh, saying sense, reason, act, speak, whatever. So that, that is called artificial intelligence. The very popular, the most popular branch of artificial intelligence is machine learning. And Andrew Ng, who I think is the father of AI or whatever, and I have the privilege to, you know, to be with him or, or for him to give a lecture which I could attend. Uh, he's at Stanford and he's the founder of Coursera, by the way. So Coursera courses are probably the best um, in AI. So what he's saying is machine learning is the science of getting computers to act without explicitly being programmed. So, you know, a lot of, I, as I understood people, software engineers are also in this, in this, uh, in this talk. And um, you could write a program, right? You write a program and you tell the program to do this. But in this case, the difference is that it is learning and it's doing something without explicitly saying it. It, it keeps getting better and better and better with the data, with the training on its own, it will know that, okay, this, this is what I should do. So that's the difference. And then deep learning, which, which I have focused a lot on is, is a subset of machine learning and where there are, this, this deals with a lot of data, you no know, big data, a lot of machine, and it has multi layers called neural networks. And this is, this is one of the fastest growing and most popular um, areas of AI. And I just put this slide together. I put, you know, the popular applications. It's, it's good to know, right? Computer vision. We talked about computer vision, whether it's for facial recognition, image recognition, 
even in the cars, right? When the car is, is autonomous driving, then it, it has a box which is called object detection. It says, this is a car, this is a tree, this is this. So this, that's, that is vision. Natural language processing, also a very, very hot area, text classification, machine translation. And these are all the deep learning things that, that areas of deep learning. Uh, content suggestion, ad placement. This is the uh, recommendation that I talked about. Recommendation engine, whether it's uh, you know even if it's Facebook or or it's Google or wherever, it will say you should do this. And the ad that comes in, all that is recommendation. And Tabula, by the way, that that my team worked with the slide I show is exactly that. Then there is speech to text and text to speech. That's another, and then reinforcement learning, which is what robotics is using. So, so these are some of the key areas, but there is more development have happening every day and we have something new that's coming along. Okay, um, okay, I'm try, trying to go faster. How to get started? I mentioned to you guys that there are many, many courses there, some are free, some are very inexpensive, uh, Coursera and Udacity. And pretty much any uh, big uh, company, software company or AI company would have a lot of resources. So um, Intel, for example, intel.com.ai, and um, this is software.intel.com slash AI. I cannot, this is being hidden, but um, I think it's dot AI. Um, so you, if you go there, you can get a lot of, you know, there might be tutorials, there may be other stuff, and these, these are the solutions, but these are our partners that we work with ISVs to build solutions, and in fact, uh, today I had a meeting with, with this, uh, the person who manages this program, and she came and presented what we are doing here, etc. So, so basically there is to get started, you don't need to start from scratch. There is so much material out there. And one good thing about AI is that people share a lot of information. So the papers are being put in archive, everything is open source. We develop something, we make it open source. Not just to share, but you know, people also um, do development and, and they, 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 basically help us develop things by making it open source you are getting a lot of people to work for you so it's there's a lot of sharing that's going on in the AI world um, okay so the last part is I just talked about all the good stuff right there are limitations of AI and uh, biases and fake and fakes and ethical problems. There is a lot of wrong things that can happen as well. And in fact, um, I, I about uh, maybe a month ago, I was in in a panel with uh, with the VP from um, IBM and from Google, and we just discussed this that you know what what type of biases are there and how how they they are causing so much problems. So for example, I've just listed a few things here just to give you a flavor of that. So bias through data, loan approvals. So we, there was, these are all real use cases that you know, a lot of loans were not approved for a certain demographics. There are certain neighborhoods that loans were not approved. Um, hiring tool, um, I usually don't, take the name of the company, but it's publicly available. So Amazon had um, a hiring tool that they had to shut down because it was biased against women. There was a chat bot, uh, Microsoft had started a Tay, a it was called Tay, a chat bot, and it had to shut down. So why did this happen? Because there were biases through data. So loan approvals, um, the, the, the way the data was presented was biased towards, so, so if you have applications and say, these are the people who are successful and, and they are, you know, these are the names, these are the types, this is the neighborhood they live in. So the, the AI will only understand that and it will see something from the other neighborhood, which was supposed to be not a good candidate. It will never approve loan for that. Similarly, hiring tool, um, for that, the historic data that they had given um, was historical data was all men, white men that were successful candidates. So it, it actually was rejecting women. 
and so they had to shut it down of course and but but there was i mean if you go google it you will find similarly chatbot it was very good and it was talking and then people started teaching it uh, wrong things and then it started saying those things because it learned from that right then deep fake is another kind of adversarial um, th th so here there's a, this picture that i have here and that was uh, buzzfeed they put out a video of president obama and and he wasn't saying that but but it sound you know they made it sound like the lips were moving and this is very pretty common these days right adversarial gans and they do exactly that that you can make somebody say something which they haven't said and the stop sign there that was berkeley um, uh, did an experiment uc berkeley which is also uh, close to where i live um, and they had a stop sign and they put the stickers there and the stickers um, to you and me there's just graffiti or whatever but to a car it didn't think it's a stop sign and so so that could cause real problems right so so those kind of things that are wrong and then the solutions are there's a lot of work that's happening in ethical ai and transparency and explainability uh, privacy so there's a lot of this is a topic on its own we, you know you can uh, look up and uh, there's a lot of research happening on how to fix this a lot of progress has been made but that's something that has to be fixed and i think i'm probably almost out of time time but uh, you know fair explainability secure so these are the work that we have been doing and we work with world bank uh, to clean up so these are the good you know social good type of examples that i have here that we were able to you know help help with the world bank to to remove those to clean up some data and so so there were the different types of vendors and the data could not be used because it had personal information so we helped with that this was in africa we were able to um, to basically tell uh, with 95% accuracy if the water sorry if if the water was clean and this is a neural compute stick that we have intel has and so we were able to do that and this one was uh, preserving the great wall of china we actually did with the help of drone i i actually did climb somehow it started to move on its own uh, i actually did climb uh, the great wall of china but the shorter route but basically the the you know with the drone um i don't know why it's moving but anyways so with the drone we were uh, able to stitch it and find out where are the problem areas to aid, to aid restoration and, and those kind of things uh, um, this uh, was oh this is a very interesting case in fact this was with leonardo di caprio's organization and to this was anti poaching and we were uh, able to detect if there is a poach poacher there and then send the picture um, to the to the park ranger and then they would be able to tell if it's an animal or whatever um who box is another very good use case that by facial gestures uh you could i have no idea why this keeps moving but with, with facial gestures you could move the wheelchair and and that was a really good uh, use case that we have in fact we're still working with that brazilian company and this was something we help with uh, missing exploited children we were able to do it very fast and since the slides are just moving on their own i think this is the last slide uh, which says that ai is poised to to make remake the world but beware the hype learn to leverage ai uh, use open source but use ai in an ethical manner and understand the limitations so i think this is my last slide and i will stop here so sure. thank you madam for an insightful presentation on artificial intelligence its applications as well as its limitations uh, considering the time difference as it is already past 10 in us uh, we may take questions with madam abidi so who is ever want to ask questions please raise your hands uh, we'll unmute you and you may ask questions from madam abidi please raise your hands
either it was really good or really bad. I don't know which one. <laughs> I, I would uh, say it does take some time to absorb everything. What you're I know, saying. I'm going so fast. <laughs> okay. So till the time, till the time these children are trying to figure out what they want to ask. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Uh, of I course. would like to ask. Uh, are there any examples of uh, AI being used in science communication? Science communication? Yes. We are trying to communicate simple concepts of science to students in an interactive way. Oh, you mean in education? In education. Okay. Yes, 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 there are. In fact, um, there are quite a few examples. So one of them, um, I mean, it's not, not necessarily for science or whatever, but in general education, one of them actually was not as successful because they, were, they had put um, cameras and, and they were kind of observing the students and seeing based on their expressions, they would say the subject is interesting or it is not. So they will say that the, the student was not paying attention at this point. So what was the reason? So that was a lot of AI because they're using vision and then based on expression and say 50% of the students were attentive. And, and so maybe the material was boring. So there was both pros and cons. Some people said, you know, privacy and because of, you know, this, but that, that was one use case used. Um, the other was actually somebody I know they implemented it and what they had done was using AI to basically find out how to individualize uh, the learning rather than every, at the same pace. So based on the results, they would say, okay, this person should be doing. So AI will be faster to figure out what can be done. And so they use that. Uh, but there, I'm sure there are a lot more, but uh, those are the two that come to my mind. Thank you so much. I was also wondering whether, because you have a lot of uh, um, good science centers in California. So I was mm -hmm. wondering, does any, any one of those centers has any um, gallery on AI where people can just go and see and try and learn what you have all? So, uh, you know, some, it's, it's like being everywhere, right? So, for example, if you walk into an Amazon store, I don't know if you've been to Seattle, my daughter was doing internship there at Facebook, that's when I went. So you enter an Amazon store and you just go, you pick up something and you walk away. And this is all AI, right? It figures out what you bought, you had the card, it will just charge you and you just do it. So there are, it's becoming like norm. It's, it's not like a special exhibition or something. It's like part of your normal day, normal day to day life. So AI is being used everywhere, right? So I'm, I'm talking about what I'm doing with customers, but Intel, whether it's HR or, you know, whatever is happening, they're all using AI for, for different things. Um, so you could visit, a, for example, a Tesla uh, a manufacturing place and, or somewhere, and then they would give you, a, you know, that how autonomous driving works, or you go to Uber, they'll give you a demo. So those kind of things are there, but I don't know of any one place where they will have a specific example. It's like everywhere, you know, Stanford. Stanford has a really nice, in fact, I, I work with them also. I've been associating with them. It's called human-centered AI. And that's just fantastic because the goal is to do, to do, you know, work on AI for betterment of human beings. Kiranbeet Kaur, uh, Kiranbeet, you may please ask. Hello, ma'am. Hi. Ma'am, it, it was a very beautiful presentation and thanks for presenting. I... I'm really inspired and I am currently a beginner in AI. So I just, okay. there are so many topics that we can work on. So mm -hmm. as a beginner, which topic would you suggest that we should start? Because I don't have really very fast knowledge, but I like to code. So what is it that you suggest that we should start as a woman that could uh, help others, other women that could make me set an example for the ones that really want to work on AI. Yeah, so firstly, how to learn. There's two ways of learning. One is, you know, going to school. 
school learning and the other is learning on the job. So I, without knowing your background, I would say if you want to learn on your own, again, uh, you know, lots and lots of uh, tutorials are there and, and uh, Coursera is the one that I recommended that Dr. Andrew Yang had formed. So the, you can start with the you know, basics of machine learning and then TensorFlow or deep learning is the, is the area that I'm working on. So these are open source use cases. So you, if, excuse me, frameworks. So you would start with the basic of machine learning course, which will be, you know, really hands-on. You will be able to, you know, use the, the, the point is that all the frameworks are already there. You don't have to write it. You just have to use it. So use there, I can send you the link, but, but basic machine learning course where you're actually using it and writing, it's, it's very little of code, but you are invoking or, or calling TensorFlow or different APIs and you will be able to write a very basic model where, for example, you just want to say, I mean, I, I have lots of demos that I probably could have shown, but Say you want to know, is this a rose or you know, what kind of flower it is or whatever to identify that. So very simple, uh, you learn that course, you should be able to write a program which, which you will be able to identify if it's a rose or a bicycle or whatever. So start with that. Um, and then as you keep learning more, you will have you know, more and more advanced courses that you can learn. And the other side of it is uh, learning on, your, on the job. That's the best way of learning. That's how I learned everything, right? So if you are able or fortunate enough to find a job, um, then, then that's, that's very good because you are applying AI to whatever you are doing and going from there. So, so I would suggest, you know, look up, um, find tutorials that are there, at least do one solid course that gives you the background, the basics, and then go from there. Thanks a lot, ma'am. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and also, sorry, I forgot to mention there are a lot of volunteering opportunities also. If, if there's, it's difficult to find jobs, there are many, many organizations that, that you do it for free, but then you end up working with a lot of people and you get um, uh, you know, experience uh, in AI. So that's also available if you look up on Google. Yes, ma'am, I will definitely work on it. Thank you so much. We have a question from Madam Renuka Bhatti. Uh, Madam, please unmute yourself. I think I think I'll be mute. Yeah, you will have to unmute. Unmute. Uh, uh, am I okay now? Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, all right. Hello, ma'am. It's very nice to Hi. hear you and uh, listen to your talk, especially your artwork was also too good. <laughs> I know, I put that in <laughs> it was to really, make it really interesting. Inspiring. <laughs> thank you, yeah, thank what you. I want to ask is that I'm a physics person actually, but I am equally interested in music. So okay. uh, can you tell me how it, artificial intelligence is being used in music and can it be helpful to share with uh, some people your videos or your music while you are actually playing it? Yeah, so, so the way artificial intelligence, or let me just talk about deep learning, the way it works, I don't know if I have a slide, but forget the slide. So the way it works, there is two things. One is called training and one is called inference. So there is always a okay. model. There's a model okay. and whatever task you want it to do, you train it with a lot of data. And I'm not saying you have to train it. They're all there already. Like for example, if my team, has a model that's trained, we put it out there, it's called model zoo. People can just access it. So for music and for other things, there are models that are already there. And what they are doing is, now they, they are so good that they, based on the training, they start generating its own oh. music. Okay. And, and this is a new field. So this is a new newer field. And, and okay. all of them, Google, right? Just Google it and you will find. All right. So okay. there are, you know, the, you can't tell the difference whether it was, the AI model that created that music or whether yeah. it was you. So that's a different, that's what I was talking about. But the other use cases are, you know, what kind of music this is, right? So there are so many applications that, you know, my husband and I are driving and like, what song is this? And we will just say, either ask Google or any, yeah. any other application, right? And say, what is it? And it will know immediately because it has been trained. So that's there are right. many different types of music use cases uh, that can be done. 
And so applications are the you know, easiest way for you. There's an application that will tell you, okay, do this. And, and they are monetizing that and using it. But um, the science behind is exactly that, that there is more data, there's more music, you feed it, it will know, and then it will be able to do that. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure listening to you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I, I know it, I went very fast and I know I had a lot of information, but I wasn't sure what to share, what not. So I was like, let me just put a it bunch It was of... really good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we, we have a question in the chat box uh, from Suman Kurana. She says, uh, thanks a lot for the very informative session. Please elaborate more on the usage of artificial intelligence shown in the case study of Wall of China. The wall of China. Okay, so that the reason I gave that example is that it, it's it's a it's huge, right? It's very very miles. I don't know how many miles long, and there are things that are broken. So how to fix it for a person to go and take a video of all of that and then come back and then figure out do a model of that and figure out this is how how expensive it would be to fix this part. But what was done, we have drones also, right? So the drone would take the picture oh, yeah. and then based on, on um, simulation, it wasn't even simulation. So it was stitching it together. It would be able to say, these are the areas that need to be fixed. This is how you can fix it. This is how much it will cost. And it would pinpoint that this is where, so it, it's, you know, you can imagine how much time and money was saved by giving this, this, this plan that this is how you go and fix it. So that's, that was the whole, um, you know, the project behind it. Uh, a girl from government high school, Barnala, is asking, ma'am, uh, can you please share some examples of artificial intelligence that could be helpful to us, especially girls, during unsafe circumstances? Very good question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I have, um, I, in fact, I heard about it um, again, and I think it was from India. And, and that was also using, so there's, there's two ways of, of that, the, the cameras. So in the US, there have been lots of issues and uh, about privacy laws and, and using these cameras. But I've heard, um, uh, especially in India and some other countries that they have these cameras out there and by seeing the expressions of, of people's faces, they could tell that this, there is a distressed and, and because of that, there were some, you know, things that were done. So that was, I've just read about it. I personally, I don't know many, but others are, um, you know, whether it's Uber or whether, you know, other places that they are, uh, you know, drivers and, and security. So information is shared and a lot of that information, AI is being used in that. So unfortunately, I don't have a lot of, I've just read about it. And I think it was um, in India that they were looking at that the cameras were there and by expression. Now it's AI is getting better and better by, you know, looking at your expressions I mentioned in education. Similarly, if, if they can detect that there is distress on the face, then it will just send the signal uh, to somebody and, and that way it, it can be um, caused. But, but, but that's a great question. I unfortunately don't have many examples, but I know that people are working in that. Um, our next speaker, Ms. Kushi Sharma, she has a question. Uh, Kushi, please ask. Uh, hi, uh, your presentation was wonderful. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, as I'm a squash player, uh, so how can AI help me improve my game? Squash, how can it help me? You know, I have a very good um, family friend and he has written an, an AI application that is for tennis. Um, so, just like I used to play tennis before. Huh? What's that? I I used to play tennis before I joined squash. Oh, actually. I see. Yeah, oh, that's that's cool. Squash is good too. So his, I can send you the application. He's a very good friend of ours. In fact, he's a friend of my son's, uh, a little bit older than him. But he his app his uh, app. I just saw the notification. It's become extremely popular, and all the top tennis uh, stars are using it. So it is to, uh, you know, it's basically using um, your statistics and how you are doing and how you can improve your game. And, and AI is much faster at telling you, um, I am not a 
you know, big players. So I wouldn't know the details, but there are apps there that can, based on, um, based on learning your personalized, you know, what, what you do and what makes it better and where to improve. So you can just imagine that uh, the more data you feed in, the more data it sees, it will look at your form, look at your scores, and then say, if you did this, it would be better. So, I mean, these are not the use cases that I use at my work, but it's easy for, um, for me to imagine. Um, and I know that it exists because uh, Swapnil is, is that, that kid who, who created it. In fact, uh, I can find it right now. It's called Swing, I think. Um, that app is, is, is pretty popular. I think Andy Roderick um, is one of the partners in that thing. I'm in between and say कि अगर वहाँ पे कुछ बच्चे हैं जो हिंदी में कुछ क्वेश्चन पूछना चाहते हैं तो हाँ बिल्कुल मैंने तो शुरू में ही कहा था कि आप लोग बिल्कुल इस भी बहुत साल हो गए मुझे गए हुए बंगाल रहे हिंदी बहुत अच्छे से हिंदी पंजाबी तो बहुत अच्छी नहीं आती थोड़ी बहुत लेकिन आराम से पूछे बिल्कुल any other question, please? Kisi ko Hindi mein bhi baat karni, interact karna. Kisi saath aap please kar sakte hain. You may please raise your hand. I have one question. Yes, please. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, we are since we are uh, at Science City and uh, we are setting up different galleries, scientific galleries, and uh, there are so many exhibits coming, uh, you know, over there. So uh, I just want my question was that how AI could be used to generate data to analyze the visitors' behavior that which exhibit has been liked the most and which they had liked the least so that at least we can analyze and we can uh, you know uh, read uh, design those kind of exhibits i think that's a, that's a relatively simple thing to do as long as the data is there so it's all about data if you have the the data that these are the people you, you need to find that out right that how how many people like this how many people like that so what AI can do is take that data and it can tell you and uh, predict for you that this kind of people, this set of people would like this better. So that's the job of AI. It can predict for you, it can tell you, but you need to tell it, you need to give that basic information, whether it's historical information or, or, or something. So it will be able to tell you this type of people will like this kind of exhibition or this place or this time, whatever, but it needs to have that information. So if you've had um, some information that historically, um, this is what we, the exhibition was, these many people like. So are you talking about exhibitions all over the world or, or in your area or, or can you give- Talking of the scientific data? galleries, basically, we are having scientific exhibits, basically. Uh, visitors, they do interact with the kind of the exhibits they come over there. And then they sometimes they want to spend time, uh, they have more time for interaction and uh, there are certain exhibits where they don't want to spend time. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's uh, basically uh, what my question was, uh, sometimes A could be biased also because it could, you know, uh, generate data, which it could be the face expression kind of thing. And uh, maybe the, it could uh, generate bias data also. So bias would, Bias would mean if, if it is incorrect. Bias would mean that um, it, it incorrect in the sense that it is, it is say biased towards a certain set of people and say only, only because only men came to that exhibition, it will say women don't like it because it doesn't have data, women never came to it. So bias would be like that. But um, uh, if you want to see, again, it has to have that data, you have to have collected that information once before because it, it, uh, otherwise AI has no way of knowing what people would like. So it, it is much better in predicting um, if it has been fed that information that this, we had an exhibition back then, um, people stopped more time. I mean, it depends on what features you want to track, right? So you want to track uh, different types of um, exhibitions and how much time a person spent on it or whatever. And so then, then it can generalize, then it can create a model, then it can figure out that, um, that, that you should uh, pace them apart 
you know, this way or time, maybe morning was a better time for this, maybe for school students, you should come in the afternoon, maybe the women like this certain kind of thing. So it will be very easy for it to tell that, but, but it has to have, the more data you have, the better it will. It cannot guess without information. I can see a whole class from Sanskriti K and B. Uh, would anybody, any child like to ask any question from that class? I can see about 50 students sitting there. Yes, they are raising their hand. Please unmute them. Sanskriti K and B, please unmute. Yes, you are unmuted, ma'am. Namaskar, ma'am. Namaskar. Ten classes standing, uh, sitting in front of you. The good uh, students are in front, and on the from their side, I would like to thank ma'am Agiti for giving us uh, uh, learning today. Not only the students, we the teachers have also learned. New things from Ms. Abhidi. Thanks a lot for your participation. Thank you. And really, artificial intelligence. A new thing, a very uh, future of uh, the whole world, the students, they would like to go in for sciences after uh, completing the test, and they would definitely join the AI courses offered awesome. in different schools. Colleges and universities. Thanks for the good learning thank you. for us. Thank you, Ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much for saying that. And it is wonderful to see the students and all of you. And even if it makes a difference to one person's uh, path, I will. I will feel really, really happy. So you know, I, I hope I was able to influence. It. Even if it's one person who's is impacted by this, my job is done. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. In so the much. chat box, there is also a question. It's not very well drafted, but I will try to make sense out of it. This question is from Anshita Atri. Anshita, aap khud puchna chahoge Hindi mein ya Punjabi mein ya main padu. Anshita Atri, chalo main pad deti hu. The question is that AI is making our life easier. You believe that there will be a time in our life when we would be completely dependent on it and human efforts would vanish in daily course. She's asking the question, will that happen? Actually, that's a very, very good. Oh, sorry. Please yeah. continue. And it has a second part to it. What would be the basic thing which could bring a massive change in the society like AI in cars did? You know, that, that's a brilliant question. And that's a question that I'm asked when I, you know, go and talk to different organizations and all. And, and uh, I think I alluded to that when I mentioned um, general intelligence versus narrow intelligence. So when you talk about general intelligence where, where there'll be, you know, people talk about, first thing they, they used to ask before was that, you know, the killer robots and they will take over the world and this, that. So that thing is very, very, very far away. But um, the way AI is progressing, the kind of jobs that are automated, that can be automated will definitely be taken over by AI. But the kind of jobs um, where there is, you know, more human interaction involved uh, that is not something that, that uh, AI can replace, not in the near future. So um, the, uh, by automation, I mean, even the, the car driving, right? So it's not happening right away. And, and by the way, when I remember 2012, 2014, whenever I went to CES in Las Vegas, uh, the consumer electronic show, they said the autonomous driving, full autonomous driving will be done next year. It has been many, many years and it has still not reached. So it can drive uh, to a certain extent, but you still have to keep your hands close by. So it, 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 the, eventually, you know, the drivers, uh, the kind of jobs will be replaced, but there are many new jobs that were created by AI. 
so it it is going to change our lives and and you know just like industrial revolution when it happened you know automation happened and then the the manual uh, menial task were were given would had to be replaced similarly it will happen so i think we need to watch out but wherever there is automation wherever there is you know, the robotics and machinery and packaging and driving those things will be the first ones to go and uh, the other kind of things uh, as i mentioned that where there is it's very very far from from mimicking a human even a 3 4 year old child will be able to just put the context behind things that a robot or ai cannot so it is um, it is a very good question um, and uh, we have to watch and see but it's not some very near future that suddenly everything will be gone and ai is taking over but it, it's progressing at a very very high speed and so the more we learn about it the better it would be uh, we have a question from shafi makkar beta pooch sakte ho am hello ji i am lakshmi kumari te ji mere gaye ke chef makkar ji hum aapka lecture sun rahe the main aapka aise bahut acha laga मैम वी आर इन मेरे स्कूल का नाम गवर्नमेंट गर्ल्स इंडियस कैंट स्कूल दिल है ये रूरल एरिया में है तो मेरा क्वेश्चन है कि हाउ कैन एआई एजुकेट रूरल गर्ल्स हाउ कैन एआई एजुकेट रूरल गर्ल्स सो एआई हां तो जैसे अभी आप आप सीख रही हैं अभी आप ऐसे एजुकेट करेगा जैसे आप अभी आप कर रही हैं तो तो आपके ऊपर है चाहे आप रूरल हो चाहे आप सैन फ्रांसिस्को में बैठी हो अगर आपके पास इंटरेस्ट है आपके पास चाह है तो आप सीख सकती हैं जैसे आप अभी बैठी देख रही हैं द गुड थिंग अबाउट ए आई इज कि आप अगर आपके पास कंप्यूटर एक्सेस है आपको दुनिया भर के फ्री कोर्सेज हैं जो कि आप खुद से सीख सकती हैं सो आप इट्स अ रियली प्लेजर टू मीट यू और इतने अच्छे से आपने इतने स्वीटली ये क्वेश्चन पूछा तो आप आई थिंक इंटरेस्ट है तो इसी तरह से आप करती रहिए और एजुकेशन uh, आजकल एम आई टी से लेकर स्टैनफर्ड से लेकर हर यूनिवर्सिटी के कोर्सेज जो हैं वो ऑलमोस्ट फ्री हैं अवेलेबल अगर आपके पास इंटरनेट कनेक्शन है जैसे आप अभी देख रहे हैं ना करियर ऑप्शन इन ए आई हाँ करियर ऑप्शन तो है ना तो डिपेंड्स ऑन कि आप क्या किस चीज में सीख रही हैं सो पहले आप ए आई के ए आई सीखिए बेसिक बेसिक आपको आप किस ग्रेड में किस क्लास में है आप अगर आप प्रोग्रामिंग सीख सकती हैं और या फिर डेटा साइंस साइंस और इस तरह की चीज में अगर आपको इंटरेस्ट हो तो देन तो फिर आप उस एरिया में जा सकती हैं और और इतनी अपॉर्चुनिटीज हैं कि कोई कोई लिमिट नहीं है मगर आपको बस यू नो राइट राइट पाथ में जाना है बेसिक सीखना है आपको इंटरेस्ट होना चाहिए एंड एंड दिस इज समथिंग जो यू मैंने यूएस में आके सीखा कि हम जब हम लोग मैं पढ़ती थी तो ये था कि बस साइंस लो और आर्ट लो और साइंस में डिसाइड कर लिया कि डॉक्टर बनो कि इंजीनियर बनो एंड दैट्स इट यहाँ पर आके आई मीन आई वॉज स्टडिंग मेडिसिन राइट एंड यहाँ आके मैंने इंजीनियरिंग किया एंड ऑल दैट तो बगर ये कि जिसमें इंटरेस्ट हो अगर आपको जिस चीज में इंटरेस्ट हो इवन आर्ट एज आई वॉज शोइंग आर्ट को भी आप एआई के साथ कर सकते हैं ना एआई एक ऐसी फील्ड है तो यू शुड डेफिनेटली आई मीन आई एनकरेज पीपल टू डू साइंस बिकॉज आई लव साइंस बोथ माय किड्स आर साइंटिस्ट और कंप्यूटर साइंटिस्ट माय हस्बैंड इज मगर अगर आपको किसी और चीज में इंटरेस्ट है तो ये नई फील्ड इस तरह की है कि आप उसको कम्बाइन कर सकते हैं आई मीन ए आई जो है वो पॉलिसी लॉ हर चीज से इंटरसेक्शन है ओके I can talk for hours on this, but I think I'm. I'm gonna shut up now. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, any other questions? I think we should move further to our next speaker. Ma'am, yeah. uh, I have a question. Oh, ah, bilkul. Uh, ma'am, there are so many programming language. So, which programming language one should learn to go for the uh, this artificial intelligence? Then, which is mostly used in. This? Python, Python is the most widely used. Python, um, C plus plus, अभी भी कुछ लोग use करते हैं उसके लिए और R है और बाकी है, but mostly, um, you know, mostly Python. Okay. Python is the one that that is used for these programs. Mr. G S Kent wants to ask a question. Please, इनको unmute करिए. G 
ਜੀ ਕੈਂਟ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਪੁੱਛੋ ਜੀ ਅਨਮਿਊਟ ਕਰੋ ਜੀ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਸਰ ਅਸੀਂ so please unmute yourself so i i think the hopefully this is the last question cuz i have a very early morning meeting and i have to finish something so i'm, uh, I'm but not, i think yes. it should be the last question yes. ah, it is not a question uh, let me tell you madam uh, madam jarath indicated that somebody from iit kanpur and i happen to be from iit i retired 23 years back i'm talking somewhere around 1950 i had two girls in mechanical engineering and uh, at that time uh, artificial intelligence sabhi ko mute ho gaye aap thode der ke liye mute ho gaye haan ji ma'am awaaz nahi aa rahi aa rahi hai सर आप अनम्यूट करिए अपने आप को नहीं उन्होंने मीट अनम्यूट ओ सर आप म्यूट हैं जी सर आई थिंक देयर इज सम टेक्निकल इशू देयर इज सम टेक्निकल हां जी ओह सॉरी अबाउट दैट या वी आर सॉरी अबाउट दैट बट thank you thank you so much for your thank comment jo bhi tha aapka comment thank you ma'am okay uh, so i will i will drop off now thank you so much for having me and um, i will i hope we will in touch all right bye thank you, thank you so much ma'am thank you huma thank you we now move forward yes, yes ma'am thank you yes. Uh, today we have this young scientist with us uh, miss khushi sharma i am glad to introduce khushi uh, to all of you khushi is a student of class 11 kamal convent school chandigarh she is studying physics chemistry mathematics and economics uh, she has been volunteering work in the field of environment uh, summer internship with mohali municipal corporation uh, studying solid waste management and participating in the campaign to improve source segregated door to door collection she has been a research intern with the department of health and family welfare government of punjab and studied the spread of the novel coronavirus pandemic in the state as well as the country projecting the trends through mathematical modeling and steps towards preparedness uh, khushi has several publications to her credit she has presented her research work on covid-19 to the administrative secretary and other senior officers of the department of health government of punjab uh, besides she keeps uploading her research findings on her blog uh, you can check out her blog at blog with khushi uh, she is a pianist and solo performer uh, wow uh, khushi has won the girls u16 title and has runner up in the and was a runner runner up in the women's open category at the state level championship held in chandigarh in 2019 bronze medalist in national school games for two consecutive years 2018 and 2019 she plans to pursue her career in environmental sciences and analytics i invite uh, ms khushi sharma to uh, share her research work uh, with the participants and motivate them uh, khushi please the screen is all yours uh, thank you uh, good morning to everyone i am khushi as uh, ma'am has already introduced i am a student of class 11 kamal convent school chandigarh uh, before i begin i would like to thank pushpa gujral science city especially the director general ma'am nilima jarath for giving me this opportunity to speak at this august forum i feel honored to share the platform with ma'am huma bedi who is a role model for all of us 
So in my presentation, I will first share how I developed my interest in science, and then I will share my mathematical modeling for COVID preparedness. So uh, technology today has really opened up possibilities like never before. For example, how we're all meeting here and interacting across the globe to the remotest village school. This digital connect is providing us with a level playing field and opportunities have increased manifold as Huma Ma'am has said today. On my part, since my kindergarten, I have been a dreamer. I enjoyed playing with mud, have always been fascinated by the sky, always wondering about our existence, the life around uh, planet Earth and even beyond. I have always enjoyed watching the silent phase of nature, slowly at work, but consistently and nonstop. So I like to go with the flow. I have always enjoyed exploring arts. And my school has played a major, uh, my school has played a major role in my grooming. So I'm proud to share that Kamil Convent School Chandigarh has been adjudged as the number one girls' day school in India by Education World School Rankings 2020 to 21. We have an uh, excellent infrastructure, science laboratories, sports, and extracurriculars. Our principal, although she's a strict disciplinarian, has always been very motivating and encouraging. My science teachers, uh, Ma'am Archana Puri, Ma'am Swati Thakur, and English teacher Raj D. atmosphere for all-rounded development. So with my parents both having an engineering degree, so choosing PCM was a natural choice to me. However, honestly speaking, I do not really enjoy the rote learning of physics or chemistry. What inspires me to science is not the stuff I've learned about in my textbooks and all that, but the experiments I've seen and conducted. I got a chance to study in the US for a couple of years with my parents, when my parents had gone to the Princeton University for their higher education. So every week I used to look forward towards our after school engineering club activities, uh, conducting science experiments, 3D printing, playing with electronic circuit kits, building fire alarms and operating electrical devices. Uh, I also built robotic models using EV3 Lego storm, uh, Mindstorm kit. So the work in the school science laboratories, the visit to the national parks, more in the US and some in India as well, uh, the junior ranger uh, program uh, have been a great way of learning. Playful learning while doing something on excites me, something experiential and not just in the mind. Luckily today, there are YouTube channels which present beautiful models and experiments in science. I have been fortunate to have a good exposure. As a child, it was a joyful experience participating in the expositions and events, science as well as arts, uh, being conducted at public libraries at uh, Princeton, Berkeley, and even in Chandigarh. Uh, even though expensive by Indian standards, my parents would not hesitate to take me to places like the Exploratorium in San Francisco, a uh, museum in science and technology uh, of the, uh, and the Natural History Museum in New York. But if you ask me one place that truly gave me the hang of science, it was the Liberty Science Center in New Jersey. So we had bought an annual membership there. So the live experiments, uh, demonstrations, and the participative nature, uh, of everything around was too engaging and thrilling. I remember spending uh, full days at that place along with my sister, uh, playfully and joyfully, and not wanting to come there even after uh, the place was at its closing hour. So, uh, and near home, I have also visited our own Pushpa Gujral Science City, and I can bet you it is a world-class setup with beautiful science exhibits and demonstrations done very creatively. And I find the staff members quite engaging and well-informed. As I grew up, exposure to such places of excellence has taught me how to connect with science in everyday life. I prefer to observe, see, and do things. Uh, I've been into sports since very young, first into tennis and later then I took up squash. Uh, I have been playing at national level and have won quite a few medals also. 
Uh, my strength in racket game has always been my precision rather than my speed. Uh, so, uh, and this precision came as I developed a sense of inquiry and observation. I would observe the different angles at which I would hit the ball and it would finish off and the opponent is not able to reach it. With what force the ball should be hit and at what height and angle it should be hit so that the ball is harder for the opponent to pick. In this way, I could make the opponent run instead of him making me run. And uh, it would consume their energy and then they would wear out faster. So in all my day-to-day -day activities, be it playing a racket shot or watching flowers blossom in the garden or creating music, I find science everywhere. Science has broadened my perspective and my way to see other subjects be it drawing shadows during a watercolor painting or feeling connected to music as I study sound waves now. Not just for myself, but I have also realized how with little technological intervention, science can make a big difference to societal goals. Like during my summer internship, uh, internship program in class 10, uh, which was a part of my school activities, uh, I learned that the importance of waste segregation at source how it eases waste management in a more scientific way. When wet kitchen waste mixes with, uh, sorry, uh, when wet kitchen waste mixes with the cardboard or plastic, everything loses value and has to go to the landfill, uh, polluting the environment. However, if we keep our household waste separated, then waste has a value. The wet kitchen waste can be turned into a uh, manure because of its composting uh, properties. At the same paper, at the same sorry, at the same time, paper, plastic, glass, cardboard, metal containers can be recycled and reused. The need for landfilling can be brought down to a mere twenty percent, saving resources and conserving the environment. So uh, things happening around me uh, rouse in me a curiosity and fascination. So it happened on the onset of coronavirus. Air twenty twenty will always be remembered for years to come. A virus for the whole humanity to its knees. My last 10th board exams ended on the 18th of March amid fears and doubts. Most of us carried hand sanitizers and some even wore face masks. Then came the day-long janta curfew. The idea seemed exciting, but the news of a 21-day lockdown was quite painful, to be honest. Our long-planned class farewell and our family holiday trip were shelved. So I, I was wondering, was this lockdown really necessary? So I started studying about COVID-19 and how it could spread. As mathematics has always been my underlying passion, I found the modeling of spread of disease an interesting area. I came across the SEIR model of spread of infectious disease. Uh, it models the flow of people between four compartments so the first one is the S, which uh, represents the susceptible, the people who may catch the infection, but they're not infected yet. So. Uh, e is, uh, represents the exposed, people who have been infected but are not yet infectious. Then comes the infectious I, who transmit the virus to others. Finally, we move on to the last compartment, R. It stands for those recovered or unfortunately died fighting the disease. In the spread of an infectious disease, a key parameter, R0, the basic reproduction number is commonly used. An infected person keeps on interacting and hence infecting on an average R0 other people who in turn infect R0 others and so on. So when R0 goes below one, the epidemic dies down. R0 is a product of three factors. First is the number of contacts by an infected person per unit time. Second is probability of transmission of infection when an infected person comes into contact with others. And third is the duration of infectiousness. The signs of, of an infection very clearly brings out that with no vaccines or medicines around, government around the world had no option but to go for a lockdown. Lockdown would con curtail interpersonal contacts, further wearing masks, frequent hand washing, along with social distancing, could reduce probability of transmission on contact. Many of my classmates and family friends would often express their frustrations about lockdown or mock at the idea of social distancing. 
I could not find any TV channel or social media disseminating logical or scientific information for better understanding. They were just occupied with discussion on numbers as if some cricket match was going on and they were going to flash the end of the day score, competing India with other countries and one state with the other. So my parents encouraged me to write a blog and share my understanding with my friends. So I wrote my first blog on the 13th of April using the trends of Italy and Spain, the countries where the epidemic had hit before it came to us. Uh, I worked on different scenarios and traced how R0 will behave. I used these R0 numbers to graph. If lockdown continues, then the first epidemic cycle in India can trail off by mid-June and only 2,400 peak time infections. With so few infections, everyone around me, even my grandparents, were questioning the confinement indoors. So then in my next blog, I shared how our lower infection, initial infections did not matter. R0 plays a much more important role. So this figure, uh, it, depicts, it depicts that a city with initial thousand infections, but lower R0 is overtaken by the other city, which has 10 times lower initial infections, but double the R0 in just two to three weeks time. By mid-April, there was a lot of noise about testing strategies. So I analyzed the data of countries with more than 5,000 reported cases at that time, and found that when number of tests at uh, and found that when number of tests per detection were high, the case fatality rate was low, implying early detection could save lives. When India started deploying rapid testing kits, my next blogs emphasized on the need to devise a smart testing strategy. Testing helps identify and isolate cases, reducing contact rate of infected with susceptible, hence controlling the, sp hence controlling the spread. But it can be counterproductive when prevalence of the infection is low. Suppose in 10,000 people, only 100 are infected, uh, meaning prevalence rate is about 1%. So with 1% testing error, 99 of them would report positive, while out of the uh, 9,900 uninfected, 99 would falsely report positive. So with the testing accuracy, accuracy of 99% and a presumed prevalence of 1%, 50% of people who clinically tested positive would actually not be infected. Isn't it surprising? So this was a simple application of Bayes' theorem in probability. So in my 12th June blog, I presented a live do-it-yourself model. I had built it using Excel. It works well for any city, state, or country. So you specify its population, the present data of number of infections, uh, and the number of deaths, recoveries, and the number of days in which the infec uh, infections are doubling up. Users have an option to forecast the progression of a disease, requirement of oxygen beds and ICU facilities in different scenarios. So let me explain how I did it. I calculated the values for the solution of ordinary differential equations that describe the SEIR model on Excel sheet based on initial statistics and some well-accepted assumptions. So, uh -huh. okay. So these are the four differential equations which are at the core of this model. The first equation tells about rate at which susceptible population is getting exposed. Uh, we can see that it is uh, directly proportional to the number of active infections and number of susceptible people. Second equation governs the rate of change in exposed fraction of population. So two things are happening here. Some of the susceptible people are getting exposed to the infection and some of the already exposed people are getting infectious and moving to compartment I. Third equation tells us about the rate of change of active infections. So again, some of the exposed uh, people have moved into this compartment and some of the already infectious people have recovered or died. The final equation governs the rate of recovery. Here, for the simplicity, uh, we have assumed that those who have recovered develop immunity. Uh, some of the other assumptions of this model are that the recovery period is taken as 14 days, uh, and only a small percentage of the total infections are detected and may need hospital care. 
So the range may vary from three to five percent. Uh, one percent of the total infections may need oxygen, and one third of these may need ICU care. Infection fatality rate, which is the number of deaths per infections for India, initially it was estimated at 0.15%. Uh, this ratio is assumed to be constant for a given demography. It means that out of 1 lakh uh, infections, 150 people would succumb. Case detection depends on many factors like uh, testing and health-seeking behavior of the population. We do not know what percentage of the infected report to our healthcare. So for any epidemic, more than reporting of cases, death reporting forms an important data because it tells us about the spread of an infection more accurately. So as in today, we have 1.1 crore or 11, uh, 1.1 crore detected cases in India. Uh, recent zero surveillance tells us that one in five Indians have been infected, implying in 136 crore or 1.36 billion population, more than 28 crore people have already been infected. So detection is just about 4%, which goes well with the assumption of my model prepared on the 12th June 2020. Uh, for the state of Punjab, my model forecasted a peak of epidemic cycle by the end of August with daily case reporting of 2,500 and hence projecting the requirements for 22,000 hospital beds and uh, 1,500 intensive care beds. The model further forecasted total 1.35 lakh detection by the end of first epidemic cycle. Looking at the actual numbers, the peak happened in mid-September with about 2,800 peak uh, daily infections. This may have ha happened due to relaxations in lockdown and increased testing. So this slide tells that with regard so this slide, yeah. So this slide tells that with regard to total number of cases and peak active cases, the actual numbers almost follow the model forecast for the first epidemic cycle. We can see that after November, there is a small second epidemic, whereas I have only modeled for the first epidemic cycle. Similarly for India, my model forecasted peak in mid-August, while actually the infections peaked in the first week of September. However, this is in line with my prediction that India would be before the state of Punjab. The purpose of my model was to make an assessment of the epidemic progression in a region and plan for necessary interventions. And it was well served, especially for the state of Punjab where I worked as an intern. My recommendations to the state health department also including monitoring the right parameters. So what was happening at the time was that total number of infections were in focus. Districts were ranked based on the number of infections. The lesser the number of infections, the better it was disincentivizing for the districts where teams were proactively working for detecting the cases as early detection can save lives. A general tendency in such a scenario was to adopt means to keep the reported numbers low. This was detrimental to all our efforts to contain the disease. So I recommended a monitoring matrix which incentivizes proactive detection and better reporting, like appreciating shorter duration from uh, symptoms to detection, more time from detection to death, and lower case fatality rate. I had suggested that with right monitoring, uh, model forecast will be more precise and public health interventions can be fine-tuned. I had also prepared a very short YouTube video summarizing some of my findings on how should we be prepared. I am happy to share that the Secretary Go Health Government of India circulated this video in all official groups across the country. Uh, those interested may, like to, uh, may check it out. I thoroughly enjoyed this research work, interacting with senior officers and working with the health department for projection of spread, uh, strategy for testing, monitoring matrix, uh, etc. Uh, uh, it was a great feeling that my work was of practical utility and helpful in the decision-making process at the state level. While I got engrossed in understanding the science behind the spread of this novel coronavirus, with impending midterms, uh, I realized that I was lagging behind my classmates. 
So after August 2020, I have been busy with my school classes and I uh, plan to pursue a career in engineering. However, I feel that a competitive entrance examination system does not provide a level playing platform to girls or, or to those who have real interest in science. It is more bent towards people who have been doing exam-oriented uh, preparation for three to four years, solving atypical, atypical questions and learning the tr uh, tricks and uh, how to crack the short multiple choice questions. The admission process uh, abroad seems to give due weightage to research work like mine. Uh, also, after having a couple of years education in the US, I am very uh, fascinated about the system. And, uh, but it is a costly affair, so with very few and limited scholarship offers. And I do not want to be a burden on my parents. So hopefully my passion towards science and work towards society should take me some good college for my undergraduation. That's all for now. Thank you for hearing me out. Uh, thank you, Kushi, for sharing your research uh, with the participants. Uh, you are surely a motivation, motivation for young girls. And we wish you all the best for future. Uh, we'll take questions with Kushi. Uh, so whoever has questions, please uh, message in the chat box or raise your hands. We'll take up the questions. I must say, Kushi, that it is a, it has been a wonderful presentation and really good scientific work. Really, really good scientific work. Very well done for that. I hope you'll continue to take the good work. We have some chat questions. Yes. Yeah, uh, we have a question from Amit Sinha. Uh, he's in the chat box. He says, if we look at your total infections, then your chart flattens, whereas it again shows a rise. Why so? So uh, as we know that epidemic spreads in cycles, so I have projected the figure for the first epidemic cycle. And if we look at the actual data, it shows a second cycle through uh, the smaller. Uh, we can extend my model to take into account subsequent cycles. Uh, okay, uh, there's a question from Vikas Sharma. Uh, Patak sir, can you please uh, unmute him? He unmuted. Vikas, please, you may ask. Vikas is uh, messaged in the chat box. Uh, he says that, can you please elaborate? How did you arrive at the assumption? Okay, so I had the luxury to have data from uh, other cities where the epidemic had uh, already spread. So I used data from Wuhan, it it Italy, and Spain, uh, and I keeping in mind with the uh, Indian context. So I just uh, modeled for that and took the uh, assumptions from the papers I've read before. Any other questions, please? Okay, uh, I think there are no more questions. Okay, Sonia Singh. Sonia Singh, please ask. Uh, Vikas has another question. He says, any view on why infection spread in Southeast Asia is different from European countries? Uh, so in our demography, uh, there were less old people, like our population is more of the youth in India, like uh, speaking, uh, there is like, I think, uh, I'm not exactly sure about the figures, I'm forgetting the figures right now, but there is more youthful population, so the immunity is better, so uh, that is why it is different. Okay, uh, there's a question from Sonia Singh. Uh, she says, uh, how can artificial intelligence improve your model? Uh, so AI can be, act AI is actually very helpful as we can use the real time data from cities all across the world dynamically for our projections. It can, uh, yeah, it can better the model modeling process. 
Okay. I think that's all. Uh, moving further. Uh, I, uh, can, can I ask something? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Kushi, I just wanted to ask you, I mean, I would like you to share with other uh, students who are here on how did you decide on the model? Who suggested you that the SEIR model was a better model? Um, I mean, so that in case they want to take up similar things, they can also lay... Uh, uh, basically, model. it was actually uh, my dad who started like uh, researching on COVID first. So I got the inspiration for him from him. And then he actually suggested me some papers that I could read. And then from those papers, I basically was like, uh, I learned more about it. And so I saw that it was the ba most basic model, the SEIR model. It was the most basic model. So from there, I had uh, done all that. So I would just like to share with other students who are listening to me that children, you guys read, read books. Read books that are beyond reading. Take extra information. Today, you have a source of Google. And when you read a good paper, you get inspiration to yourself to do something new. And I think Khushi also got inspiration from that. So you all इनसे ये इंस्पिरेशन लीजिए और आगे किया करिए संस्कृति केएमवी वाले कुछ कहना चाहेंगे संस्कृति की कोई बच्ची कुछ पूछना चाहती है इनको अनम्यूट कर दीजिए प्लीज जी यू आर अनम्यूटेड हमें आपकी आवाज नहीं आ रही समझ नहीं आ रहा अच्छा माइक के पास आ सकते हो मैम आप इस बच्चे का क्वेश्चन बोल के सुना सकते हैं Unfortunate that uh, many people uh, were have become unemployed and like uh, especially poor people. So uh, the government should definitely do something about this. Uh, and um, so, uh, uh, she uh, she's an eighth standard, and she would also like to become a doctor. When okay. She, uh, you must be pursuing with medical skill, we suppose. Uh, why? Plus one, you have. You are following plus one medical? Uh, no, I, I've chosen PCM. I've chosen PCM. But uh, I, I remember when in 10th standard, uh, I used to read biology. It was quite interesting. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, we have few compliments for Kushi uh, from Amit Sinha. He writes, Dear Kushi, really nice presentation and elaborating all things nice. Keep it up. Uh, then Rikas Sharma writes, very informative with, uh, presentation. So any other question? Uh, thank you, my dear. Uh, now I request Dr. Rajesh Grover, Director, Science City, to propose a vote of thanks, sir, please. Thank you, Lavleen, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, as we come to the close of this webinar, uh, it's my pleasure to propose a vote of thanks. Uh, we are uh, grateful to Ms. Huma Abidi, uh, Senior Director at Intel California, for uh, delivering a very interesting and uh, informative talk at the occasion. Uh, of uh, International Day for Women and Girls in Science. She talked about how AI technologies are being used for 
numerous uh, applications including fast drug discovery to fight uh, diseases like cancer optimizing crop yields smart cars and drones etc etc and then uh, more importantly and uh, she talked about how ai can change the life of women across the world and its uh, potential for evol evolving gender equality uh, in our societies she rightly said that uh, ai or any technology must be used in an ethical manner she had to uh, leave in between uh, but i was sincere thanks to her for being with us and uh, gracing the occasion and uh, i also express my gratitude to our worthy director general dr neelima jairat for uh, her inaugural address and sharing the words of wisdom in fact uh, it is because of her uh, only we got an opportunity uh, as she was instrumental to bring uh, miss abidi on this platform thank you ma'am uh, for your constant guidance and support to organize this uh, webinar and uh, today we also had the opportunity to listen to a uh, young researcher and a very talented girl uh, miss khushi sharma uh, thank you khushi for sharing your achievements as well as uh, research work on developing a mathematical model and simulating the differential equations governing the sier sier model of epidemiology i am sure your talk has uh, inspired all our participants especially you are uh, and i must say that you are certainly a role model for the young girls to uh, pursue career in the scientific research thank you for being with us and uh, i sincerely thank all our participants for joining us and their patient listening and uh, interacting and making this event a success and uh, last but not the least i acknowledge the cooperation and uh, perfect logistics support i received from my colleagues i thank one and all for involved directly or indirectly thank you very much thanks once again thank you thank you everybody thank you so much for being here thank you. i'm sure you all enjoyed and i'm sure uh, we, we have also learned i have learned a lot today i have learned from huma and i have also learned from khushi khushi i cannot solve all those differential problems <laughs> posed before us <laughs> so, even if some of you are interested if we can motivate some of you to take science as a career it would be a success of the pushpa gujral science city so thank you very much everybody thank it was you. wonderful having all of you